All right. Good morning and welcome to Calvary Chapel. Ah, so good. You guys are fired up today. I love it. God is moving in the Middle East. And there's a reason to be fired up and a reason, Lord, to be, ex- a reason to be excited about what the Lord is doing, not the horrible things. Again, I always have to qualify this because, again, we grieve and our heart breaks at the atrocities that are going on in Israel and around the globe, uh, and our heart is broken. But at the same time, we rejoice in the fact that Jesus Christ said when these things begin to happen, his return is closer, and all of this kind of stuff is going to come to an end forever. And I'm ready for that day to take place. That's why I rejoice. Now, today we're going to do a little something different. We're going to do a quick Israel update, and then we'll get into the subject we're going to be covering. But I have an announcement for you guys before we do it. You guys probably noticed out here the little bit of turn lane that we had they took away from us coming into our entrance. So it seems like rather than getting better, it's getting harder to get in and out of the property, and we're not getting any smaller as a fellowship. So continue to pray that God would give us another avenue on and off the property. We're praying about that and hoping to make a move soon on something in that direction. So be praying for God to open the doors for that to happen. But in the meantime... A couple of reminders. Uh, One is when you're up there in that left lane leaving, there is enough room for one car at least out there. I don't know about two, but at least one. If you get in that left lane and you're able to go ahead and get to that middle lane and stop kind of as a staging area while you wait to merge in, that'll kind of help the traffic flow going to the left, keeping us moving into that middle turn lane safely. The problem is It's usually the biggest line because everybody's heading down toward Knoxville, that direction. So there is another way to get out of here that we may need to start doing until we get another entrance and exit. And if you're tired of waiting in that left line, go to the far right lane and turn right. Now note this, take the first four rights and you'll end up at Alcoa Highway. You'll turn right out of our driveway. The next right is Weigel's. The next right is Old Maribel Pike. The next right is Topside Road, which takes you right down to Alcoa. And when you get down to Alcoa, if you stay right, it'll take you right down to it and you can go toward Knoxville on this side. Or if you cross the bridge, they now have opened it up to where if you cross over the bridge, over Alcoa, you can come back down to the other side and not have to cross that traffic and just get on. It's hard either way, but at least you can get on from either side now, okay? So I want to make sure you know that. Four rights out of the driveway, and again, uh, that's going to get you out of here and give you a path to be able to go, and that's something we're going to, again, may help the traffic flow. We may need to do for a little while until uh, we get a door opened up for something else. So be praying about another entrance and exit because God is um, God is not shrinking us any, and so we're going to need more and more ability for this property to breathe, and so be praying about that. Now, with that said, before we get into what we're going to cover today, I'm going to take a couple of weeks and kind of do a little special here, as you probably thought I would with Israel. We'll get back into Acts, at least I plan to after two weeks. I'm going to really try. But a couple of weeks, because there's some things that have come to my attention that I think we need to address, and that is, again, why we as Christians should stand with the nation of Israel. Now, I'm going to give reasons for that, especially when you look at things, whether it be right or wrong, and all the go. We're going to talk about the biblical standing, because some of you, again, may know that's what your church teaches, or that's what you heard growing up, but it doesn't really matter what Calvary Chapel teaches. Who cares? It doesn't really matter what Pastor Mark teaches. Who cares? What matters is what the Bible teaches. And you need to know the Word of God, and you need to know how to go to the Word of God and know for yourself why you believe what you believe about the nation of Israel and be able to share that because a lot of questions are being asked. Now, I'm already kind of getting into my teaching, so back to the update. Um, meanwhile, back at the ranch, as you guys know, there was, a, again, just really what I would call a real satanic attack unleashed on the nation of Israel last Saturday. And the reason I say satanic, we haven't seen this kind of uh, ugliness since World War II. And the kind of things that are happening over there in Israel are even worse in some cases than World War II. Again, as you guys know, they came in across the border and they slaughtered men and the women they took and raped mercilessly for hours then killed them. The children they killed, some babies they killed in their cribs. I mean, I'm not going to go into all the details. It was absolutely horrible. But to give you an idea of the heart and the state of mind of the Israelis right now, the equivalent of what happened in Israel percentage-wise, the number of people that died percentage-wise to Israel would be like if they came across, suddenly terrorists came across our southern border in America and went home to home for 38,000 people, killing the men, raping the women, and burning the children alive, because that's what happened. That's what happened. Now you know the state of mind, you know the state of heart, you know the horror they've been going through, you know the resolve in their heart. It truly, this is in some ways worse than the atrocities that took place in World War II. And what you guys need to realize, this is the same demonic spirit. The Bible says in the last days, it will rise again, the same demonic spirit, 
and the entire world is going to turn against Israel. Now, right now, the world, at least in part, is standing with Israel. You'd be surprised, though. I'm sure you've seen it in the news. There are already some, after one weekend, turning against Israel and blaming Israel for this. I, I, you, you, you can't make this up. But here's the reality. The Bible says the entire world is going to turn against Israel. And as Israel goes in and begins to do what needs to be done to wipe out these Hamas terrorists, you're going to see the world get more and more aggressive against Israel and louder against Israel when Israel's simply going in and doing what needs to be done to protect their people and protect their nation from these horrible terrorists that are there in the Gaza Strip. Now, I wanted you guys, as I, as I just, uh, again, to give you an idea of what's happening worldwide. Again, you've seen the demonstrations that are happening worldwide, even here in America. We're seeing people that are protesting against Israel. This last week, I never thought I'd see this in my lifetime, or, or you know, I knew it would happen again at some point, but I guess I thought the rapture would take place and then all this stuff would unfold. But in Moscow and in Berlin, I saw videos, at least videos of Moscow, now reports in Fox News about Berlin where they're putting stars of David on Jewish businesses and homes again. Now, the government's not approving of it, but the people are doing it. That shows you the spirit of Antichrist rising. That shows exactly what the Bible says will happen, this hatred. Now, why are the Jews so hated? Because God loves them and God's promised them things all the way into eternity. Satan knows that, and ever since God made the promise, his focus has been on the Jews. Are the Jews perfect? Absolutely not. Is the nation of Israel righteous? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, the nation of Israel right now is unrighteous. They've rejected their Messiah. They're not walking with God. But we're going to see today when we get into this, these poor, uh, passages of Scripture, that's not the issue. The issue is God made them a promise, and God commands us to stand with them until the end through that promise, knowing that God will keep his promise for Abraham and knowing that God will also save the Jews in the last days, and they'll be a part of our family. So by standing with the nation of Israel, you're standing with future family in Jesus Christ. There's a lot of stuff we're going to cover today, but again, I wanted to show you, first of all, this slide. I want you to understand a little bit of what's going on when you watch the news. You see Gaza over there to your left. That's the Gaza Strip. That's where the terrorists came over uh, and did everything, and that's what's going on now where they're about to go in and clean out. In that area is what is called Hamas, right? Now, up at the north, the very top in Lebanon, they're now, now they're starting to get attacked from up there. That's called Hezbollah. So Hezbollah up north, Hamas in the south, both of them are Iran. They're simply Iran, and they use a different name. Hamas is just their fighters for Iran. Hezbollah are fighters for Iran. This is all spearheaded by Iran, and so just know who it is. Now, again, on the uh, 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 eastern border up there, the Golan Heights is Syria, and they're also starting to attack from Syria. That's happening up there as far as that goes. God will protect them. God will preserve them. And you wonder, why would God allow even this to happen? Guys, note this. I believe that God is now preparing the hearts of the Jewish people to receive their Messiah. Their heart is very hard against their Messiah, and the God has said, you know, they're a stiff-necked people. He's called them that throughout history. There's a reason God says that. We love them, but the reality is they have a very hard heart toward Jesus Christ, their Savior. So what God is going to do in the last days, he will allow the heat to be turned upon the nation. He will allow things that break them and bring them to a place of brokenness and repentance. Did God not do the same thing with you? When you were coming to the Lord, God allowed your life begin to fall apart. He allowed the heat to be turned up and to finally you broke and said, I need Jesus. And I'm calling out on you. The, the land of Israel, they're going to do the same thing. As a matter of fact, before Jesus left, he said to the Jews, he said, before, the next time you see me, it will be when you're saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So their heart's going to be turned toward Jesus. God's going to pour his spirit out on them and they're going to get saved sometime here in the near future. But now, what happened last Saturday, and we now have a lot more information, and what is happening right now? A quick kind of update as to where we are. How in the world could Hamas come through and do all this and Israel not know it? Don't they have great technology? As a matter of fact, I've seen a lot of people online and, and even among Christian circles saying, Israel knew this and they did it on purpose. I've heard all kinds of crazy things. We now know from information inside Israel and connections to Israel, even in the Israeli army, as well as the American government, there was no tip-off. Nobody knew anything. This was done stealthily. Uh, there was only four or five people that knew of the operation among Hamas, and they told the fighters that day what to do and when to go. And that's how they were able to keep it silent. So if you're any accusations about somehow they knew and they did this on purpose, that's nonsense. And again, that's now coming not just from Israeli intelligence, but from American intelligence and others. And now, how were they so successful? Here's how. We now know what they did. Russia worked with Iran. Now, isn't that interesting? Some people think, is this the Russian-Iranian invasion? No, it's not. Why? That's going to happen to the north. 
When Russia and Iran come in from Ezekiel 38 and 39, which we will look at next week, it's going to be up there where you see the Golan Heights area. It's going to be up there in the northern area where they're going to enter, the Bible says. And there's a natural passageway through the mountains and a very natural battleground working into Armageddon, which will not be the Battle of Armageddon, but working down that direction into Israel. So they'll be coming in through that very natural battlefield. This time they made their incursion from the south. We know that Russia was involved because here's what happened. Uh, they have about 150 cameras along the stretch that they blew out where they crossed. Um, they had snipers, 150 snipers that were on each camera. And, and the moment they gave the command, the snipers took out all the, command, all the cameras that were across that border, which means they immediately went dark. The Israeli intelligence could see nothing. All their cameras were gone. They had electronic sensors that are all down that fence and their stations that are down through there. But Russia, we now know, gave the Hamas drones and advanced bomb technology from those drones that were able to completely pinpoint those devices, destroy them all up and down the border. So they knocked out all their communications visually and electronically, and then just blew through the wall and killed all the soldiers and took over the, 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 uh, the posts that were there, overwhelmed them with force and power. And once they did that, nobody knew what was going on, and they had hours to operate until the, until the nation figured it out. Again, it's the worst surprise they've had since 1973 when, once again, they came in on Yom Kippur and surprised them on a holiday. This was a Saturday. This was finishing the Feast of Tabernacles. They knew that was the time to attack because everybody's kind of celebrating, having their holiday, relaxing. And if there's ever a time your guard is going to be down, it's then. Then they went house to house, home to home, killing the men, raping and killing the women, killing the children, killing everything, even their pets. I mean, just burning their homes. It was total destruction. Again, stuff that was just, it's beyond even war. It's, it's truly demonic. And that's why the same spirit, again, that was in World War II is now starting to rise that, that ugly head again. Well, again, Israel went in, secured them, drove them out. And now they're still having, as you know, the battle going on. You're watching on the news down there in Gaza. They're now having some incursions in Lebanon, some fighting up there, some fighting there from Syria. We now know we have the American military in the Mediterranean that's there. And we have threats from Iran just this morning saying, if you take this any farther, there's going to be thunder in Israel. Oh boy, is there. Because if Iran, whenever they do, join with Russia and move against Israel on that northern border, the Bible says as they cross in, the Lord's going to wipe out every, almost all of their entire army. So there's going to be thunder. You can be sure of that. So we don't know when that's going to happen. Again, we don't know for sure when all these battles take place. I think that somewhere around that invasion from the north, somewhere around there, we don't know, within a year or two, maybe right at the same time, could be the rapture of the church. So we need to be ready. Uh, we don't know when the Lord's coming back. It could be a week. So um, that was my joke for the day, but you guys are so serious. <laughs> you're so serious because of, I know why you're serious, because I've been looking at all this news for a long time, and you're hearing some of it for the first time, so I apologize. I don't mean to be flippant. But again, we don't know. It could be a week. It could be a day. It could be a year, a couple of years till the Lord comes back. But, but this is, if there's ever a time to be ready, it's now. We need to be ready. And so that's what's going on currently. Now, here's what's going to happen. You're going to see the world turn against Israel as they go and take care of business. Okay, you would think, come on, they went in, they, they, they raped their women, they killed their men, they burned children alive. They now know because of the smoke in their lungs. That's the people they're dealing with. When Israel goes in and deals with them, the world's gonna say, this is not fair, you're not doing it right, you're doing whatever. Guys, let me tell you something. If, if, if somebody came across our border and they did that to 38,000 of our people on the border, the proportion, how do you think we'd feel this morning? Do you think we'd wanna go take care of business and deal with those people that did that to our wives and our children? Now you know how Israel feels. And now you know how it's so disgusting to see people in the streets marching against Israel in this situation. Again, it's not about not loving the Palestinian people. God loves them and we love them. He died for everyone. That's not the point. These are terrorists and they're the ones that they're going after and it's gonna get ugly and as it gets ugly, you're gonna see it's already started. People in the news are already saying, I can't believe Israel and blah, blah, blah. I mean, they're, it's, it's gonna start because this is a spiritual battle. Understand that it's not logic. There's no logic here. It is all spiritual. And so, again, now you're kind of up to date to some degree. I encourage you to go out there to some of the sites. It's a great site. Amir Safari is a great site. Um, and that's kind of an odd name. A-M-I-R, if you don't know that. Uh, Safari, I think, is T-S-A-F-A-R-D-I or T-I, whatever. I think it's T-I. But you'll be able to find it if you look it up. There are some fake sites out there that claim to be him. 
with Behold Israel and his own Telegram or whatever. Ignore those. I think the Behold Israel sites, find the real one. You can find him on Telegram. He's a true believer. He's a prophecy guy. He's from Israel, lives in Israel. He's pretty much Calvary Chapel as far as I'm concerned. And, um, and so again, a great source. He's connected to the military and what's really going on. And you get minute, really almost, almost up to the minute update. So I encourage you to look at that and that way you can keep up with it yourself. But now I wanna pray. I don't want to shift gears into what we're looking at today. We have a lot to cover, and I maybe went too long on my update, but why Christians should stand with Israel. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to the nation of Israel. We know, God, that they are not a godly nation. We know they're not honoring you now, but, God, you're honoring them because you made a promise to Abraham, and you made a promise to the descendants of Abraham through Isaac. And, Lord, you've commanded us to stand with them because of that. They are future family. And so, God, I just pray now that you would just, again, protect them, continue to guard them, give them wisdom. We pray, God, for those innocent on both sides and all sides to be rescued and that you would bring them to come to know you because we know you love all and you died for all. But at the same time, God, you've specifically told the church where to stand with the nation of Israel. So I pray as we look at this today, you would open up our eyes, open up our heart, and God, you would show us why in the scripture that we're to do this. Not because we believe it because of a movement or even being just a Christian. And so we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, one of the things the Bible commands me to do is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, which is why we're doing this, because I'm hearing a lot of talk about people saying, well, God's through with the children of Israel. God's through with the nation of Israel. Uh, Again, why should the church stand with Israel and all this kind of stuff? So we're going to address everything, including when Israel does something wrong. Obviously, we don't stand with them in what they do wrong. I want to be heard clearly on that. But I want you to see scripturally why God commands the church and believers to stand with the nation of Israel so you know where to find that scripture and not just what your pastor said or your church believes, and then you know how to share that with others as this comes up, because it's going to come up more and more. I'm hearing it in the church, and to me, it's just sad because it shows how untaught the church is in our generation, but you guys are going to be taught, and you're going to not, not because I believe it again, but because you see it in the Word of God. Now, again, we're going to see today, first of all, why Christians should stand with Israel. Secondly, we're going to see where we find it in Scripture. Thirdly, we're going to see what it means to stand with Israel. Again, we're going to see it doesn't mean that we agree with everything they do. It doesn't mean they're a godly nation. They're not. It means we stand with them regardless, and we'll see why in just a moment, because God told us to. Again, it's interesting. Hosea 4, 6 says this, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Notice not the world, his people. His people are destroyed due to lack of knowledge. I don't want Calvary Chapel to be destroyed due to lack of knowledge. I want us to understand what God has said and how we're to approach this whole situation. But as I said, sadly, I've seen even parts of the church engaging in these uh, anti-Israel protests, even with such atrocities that have taken place. Again, as we noted, uh, it doesn't mean that we stand with Israel when they do things that are wrong. They're going to make mistakes. They are in rebellion to God right now. They're not a godly nation. They've rejected their Messiah. We, We could go on a list of reasons why they're wrong, but I want you to see in the scriptures today The issue is not if Israel does everything right or not. The issue is what has God called us to do because he knows the future and he knows his promises. What has God called us to do as believers in light of what God has promised Abraham and what God knows the future is? Are you following me? That's what we base it on. It's not about emotions. It's not about politics. It's about the word of God and what God expects from us as believers. And so again, uh, regardless of what Israel is doing, Um, either way. So let's jump into it. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 12. And we're going to be in Genesis um, most of the time till the very end. We'll jump into Jeremiah for one last thing. And we're going to move rather quickly because there's a lot to cover. And and boy, this time just flies. These last two services, it's flown by. This one's going to fly by as well. But first of all, what what I want to look at is God's promise to Abraham and his descendants. All right, look what it says when God calls Abraham in chapter 12, verse one. We're getting a little bit of history here to see how we got to where we are in the Middle East today and what God's promises are and what we're to do as a church of God. It says, now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. That is the nation of Israel that's lasted for thousands of years. I will bless you and I will make your name great. Again, we've seen God bless Abraham. And his name is great, and we're talking about him today. 
and you shall be a blessing. And he is a blessing because the Messiah came through his line. So note that God says, I'm going to make you great and your descendants are going to be a blessing. All right. We now have through Abraham, the children of Israel. And the reason they're a blessing to the world is not just the things they've done throughout the world that would be good for the world, but because the Messiah has come through their line. And so we've now been blessed with the Savior of the world through the promise that God gave to Abraham through the nation of Israel. But notice this, that's the first thing, God's promise to Abraham and his descendants. Notice the second thing God promised. He promised to bless those who would bless his descendants, and he promised to curse those who would curse them. Look at verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and that's in reference to the promise of his descendants, he just said in context. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Again, that's the promise of the Messiah. And again, because he's talking in context about his descendants, you could read this. Basically, I will bless those who bless Israel and I will curse those who curse Israel. That's a pretty big statement. That's what God says he's gonna do. Now, some will say, yes, but God's through with the nation of Israel. The church is now Israel. That's nonsense. There's nothing in scripture to show that. And we're going to see that in just a moment. God is not through the nation of Israel. He's given them unconditional and eternal promises that you will see in the word before we're done today. And so that's what I want you to grasp. And so again, we see that uh, God's promise to them. We see God's promise to us if we bless them. And we see God's promise to us if we curse them. It's not going to go good for us. And so again, the next thing I want you to see is God's unconditional promise to the nation. Because again, there are those who say, as we noted, God's through with them. They, after the cross, God rejected them because they rejected the Messiah. Nonsense. Turn with me now to Genesis chapter 15. We're going to see God's promise to the nation of Israel, and we're going to see that it was an unconditional promise to give them the land and fulfill with them what he said he would do. Look what it says in verse 1. It says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless in the air of my house as Eliezer of Damascus? In other words, Sarah and I can't have children. You know that. So we can't have kids. I've got to leave my inheritance to a servant in my own house, Eliezer. What are you going to do about that? And Abram said, look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, the one, this one, that is Eliezer, shall not be your heir but he who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look toward the heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. Again, at that time, they say at night, you can see about 6,000 stars. No way he could number them. And he said, so shall your descendants be. We know it's way more than 6,000, but God was making a point. You can't number them. And notice this, and he believed in the Lord and the Lord accounted it to him for righteousness. So by his faith, it was accounted as righteous to Abram for his faith in God. And then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. Now, who does the land of Israel belong to? It belongs to God. That's a great question. Good students of the Bible. I love you guys. Because people are quick to say it belongs to Israel. Well, yes and no. It belongs to God. God says it's mine. All, the entire earth belongs to God. As a matter of fact, our houses, our cars, our property, everything we own belongs to God. We're just stewards over it. And if God wanted to take it today, guys, he could. Right? He makes us stewards, and he's gonna, we're going to be judged one day on the stewardship that we've been with his resources. Now, but what we have to realize is it's God's, and God, being the owner of all the property of the earth, he can decide who he wants to give the land to. That's his right. And God is telling Abraham, I have decided I'm going to give it to you and your descendants, the nation of Israel. So when the argument comes up about who the land belongs to, God gave it to Israel, and God's the owner. So he has the right to say that. Now, when Israel sinned, God brought him out. When Israel sinned, God chastised them because he's a just God. But that didn't break God's promise to them. God brought them back in, and God said, in the last days, I'm going to take you out for 2,000 years because you killed your Messiah, but I'm going to bring you back in in the last days into the land which he's done, and I'm going to pour out my spirit on you, and you're going to believe in the very Messiah that you put to death, and then I'm going to come back and be your king and rule with you and the Gentiles who believe in me for 1,000 years on this earth. That's the promise of the Lord. And so again, he's telling him this. And he says, well, Lord, how shall I know, verse 8, that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought all these to him, and he cut them in two down the middle. Now, this sounds gruesome, but we'll explain this. 
And he placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. They typically would just tear the birds uh, after they were dead because they were too small to cut in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now there's so much going on here. What is happening? This is a legal binding contract between God and Abram. And this is how they did it back in that day. Now today, when you guys have a legal binding contract, aren't you glad you don't have to bring a bunch of animals and cut them in half? And I'd like to buy your house. Well, bring me a heifer and bring me some goats. Whatever, cut it in half. And, ah, you keep the house. I'm out of here. What is this, right? In that day, the way you made a legal binding contract was you brought animals together and the paperwork, in essence, that we sign today would be the animals being cut in half. You would put half the animals on one side, the other half of the animals on the other side. The blood would run down toward the middle. It'd be on a slanted hill so that the blood would run down toward the middle. And then you would grab, grab the, each other's hand your shoes, take your shoes off. They take their sandals off. They'd walk barefooted through the blood between the animals. And what it was saying is, this is a legal binding contract in witnessed by blood that you will keep your half and I will keep my half. And if we both keep our halves, it's a deal. If either of us break our half, deal's off. Deal's off. So that was the binding contract. So God says, all right, you go get the paperwork drawn up. You get the lawyer's. You get whatever, you know, you get your, your stock report. You bring it here. We're going to sign the paperwork in just a moment. The stock, the animals. Anyway, and um, it's not funny. If, look, if you have to tell somebody the joke, it's not funny. Anyway, but notice this. And guys, note this. Verse 11, and when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. It's interesting to me that in Scripture, birds are a type of the demonic realm. And as God is now making this covenant with the nation of Israel, look who's trying to stop it. It's no different today. God says, I'm going to give you back the land. I'm going to put you in the land. I'm going to pour out my spirit. I'm going to save you. And Satan goes, oh yeah, let's go to battle. Let's go to battle. I'm going to wipe out your children and your women and your kids. I'm going to fight you to the very end. And he's going to lose. But you got to recognize this is a spiritual battle that began back here. What we're seeing today didn't begin just in the last week or two. This goes back thousands of years. And so... Again, notice what happens. This is key here. It says, verse 12, Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. That is, God put him into a deep sleep he couldn't wake out of and begins to give him this vision. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. God's about to show him that his people will be 400 years as slaves in Egypt. So it's darkness. And he said to him, Abram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. That's Egypt. And will serve them. And they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, the Egyptians, I will judge. And afterward, they shall come out. That is, your people will come out with great possessions, that traveling through the wilderness to the promised land. And as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You're going to die and not see this, but your descendants will. You shall be buried at a good old age, but in the fourth generation, they shall return here where you are now in the land of Israel, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Look at God's mercy. What God is saying is the Canaanites are living in horrible sin. That's what was happening historically. But God said, I'm gonna give them 400 years to repent. That's a gracious God. A lot of people accuse God when, look, when God sent the children of Israel in to exterminate and wipe out the Canaanites and remove them from the land, a lot of people say, how could anybody do that? That's so horrible. When you go back and see that these, they were doing the same things that Hamas did to the Jews last Saturday. That's what was happening in Canaan, okay, on a regular basis. And so God said, I'm giving them 400 years to repent. That's a gracious God. When they didn't repent of those kind of atrocities after 400 years, God said to the children of Israel, I'm going to give you the land because the Canaanites have shown themselves unworthy. Go in and take it. It belongs to you. And God wanted them to clean them out and wipe them all out because it had been so corrupt and so evil for so long. So that gives you a little history as to why God said this. But God, look here. It's not time yet. Their sin has not reached the point of judgment. And verse 17, and it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between the pieces. And on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Notice this. He saw a burning torch, and he describes it as an oven and a burning torch. He saw the Lord walking between the pieces. Why a burning torch and all the fire? Because the Bible says the Lord is in a dark cloud. His glory is enshrouded in a cloud. Abram, in this deep sleep, sees the Lord walk between the parts. But notice who's not with the Lord. Abram. Abram is in a deep sleep. Get this. This is key. God walked through the covenant alone. God signed the legal contract alone. This is what theologians call an unconditional covenant. 
A conditional covenant is God says, if you do this, then I'll do that. We might say conditional would be you keep your half, I'll keep my half. Israel, you don't keep your half, I'm done with you. God said, no, we're not gonna do that. Stay asleep, you're out of this, Abram. I'm gonna walk through both halves myself alone. I'm keeping both halves, which means regardless of what you do as a nation, good or bad, my promise will remain to you and your descendants forever and ever and ever. You see why this is so huge? This is why when people say, well, God's through with Israel. If God's through with Israel, then this covenant was fake. Then it meant nothing. No, God said, I'm gonna keep both halves. I'm gonna make sure that I do this. You're not even a part of it. Whether you fail, even if you crucify your Messiah, I'm keeping my promise to you. Now, Abraham probably would have thought, there's no way we'd ever kill our Messiah. Well, no, even if you do that, I'm walking through these parts alone. I'm making this illegal contract alone. And that is huge today, guys, because so many people try to say that because of what the Jews have done, God is through with the nation of Israel. You thought that that argument would have ended in 1948 when they went back in the land and we began to see God's word coming to pass exactly as he wrote it. But some people still believe that. And that's why a lot of even portions of the church will stand against Israel today. They don't see that God made the covenant alone without Israel. It's unconditional. It can't be broken because God is the only one that signed the legal paperwork. Abraham didn't even sign it. He was asleep. God signed it. And notice what it says. To your descendants, here's the agreement. I've given this land. I gave Israel to you. And it's not based on what you do, good or bad. It's my promise. From the river Egypt to the great river Euphrates. What are they saying now in these chants in the streets around the world and, of course, in, in even our American streets? From the river to the sea. Have you seen that chant or heard it? From the river to the sea, Palestine free? Guys, here's the thing. What they're saying is wipe the Jews out of the land. Get completely rid of them. That means from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean, there should be no Jews. Run them off. So they're calling either for the extermination or at least the expulsion of all Jews out of the land. And God says, no, I've given it to you, not just that small portion, but from the Nile down in Egypt all the way over to the Euphrates, which is modern-day Iraq and Iran. The Canaanites, the Kenizzites, the Cabanites, the the Hittites, the the Perizzites, Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. He says, I've given all that land to to you because they're so sinful, I'm going to replace. Now, you say, why didn't Israel ever take all that land? Because they never did take the full promise of God. God made the promise. They only took it partially. I wonder how many of us today are not taking the full promise of God in our lives. God has given you all the promises of the Bible. And the Bible says all of his promises are yes and amen. Out of the 100% of those promises, what percentage are you walking in today? What percentage have you claimed for yourself? A small portion, a, a small strip of land like the nation of Israel? Or have you said, Lord, I want it all. Listen, I encourage you guys. I don't want to get too sidetracked on this. But go to God and say, God, I want all your promises and I'm willing to believe you in faith for them. Let God enrich your life with all the promises that he's made you. And I'm not talking about financial prosperity. I probably don't even have to say that to the Calvary Chapel crowd, but there's so much of that junk that's out there. I wanna make sure you know, I'm talking about simply the fullness of God and the spirit of God and the life that God has to offer. Don't reject it. Say, God, I want every bit of it. And here he's saying, I'm gonna give all of it to you. Again, they won't have it until the millennial kingdom because they haven't walked in full obedience and won't until the millennial kingdom. But now you see the unconditional covenant that God gave to Abraham, unbreakable. And for those who say, yeah, but that was the old covenant. We'll address that in just a moment. Now look at uh, chapter 16, verses one through four. And I want you to get the story here of, of Abraham and Sarah, how they started with their kids and even this battle we see going on today. Now, Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, see now, the Lord has restrained me from, from bearing children. That is, you know, God promised us a child, but we can't have one. It's called waiting on the Lord, Sarah. Now it's easier for me to pick on her because there's been times I haven't been able to wait on the Lord. You ever been there? But Sarah doesn't wait on the Lord. She gets impatient and she's now gonna try to help God out. Anytime we try to help God out and we lose patience and waiting on the Lord, there's gonna be a problem. He said, please go to my maid Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And again, that sounds odd to us today, but that was a common practice in that day, not among God's people, but among the world. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah and Sarai, that is Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, gave to her the husband Abram to be his wife. And Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Guys, here's where the trouble began. Look, I know that Satan would still be doing things in the Middle East if this had never happened, but this is the root of what took place. Abraham and Sarah thought, you know what? 
We're going to step outside the will of God. God didn't tell us to do this. We know this, you know, we're just going to do it because we're going to try to help out. After all, didn't God promise a child? And this little sin, this isn't going to hurt anything. We'll do this and it'll all be fine. Never think that your little sin doesn't have an impact. Because their little sin here is a big reason of the mess we see in the Middle East today. Now, I know it's a lot more than that. I'm not naive. I realize the spiritual battle and Satan would have done it some other way anyway. But my point is, don't think that your sin doesn't affect others because the entire Middle East is affected now because of this decision that Abraham and Sarah made. So the, the tension already begins with the birth of, of the flesh, if you will, Ishmael rather than Isaac. And so now look at uh, uh, Genesis 21, verses 8 through 13. Flip to your right there. I don't have to tell you that. Take four rights, one right out of the parking lot, one right, at, uh, another right, four rights. I'm making sure you guys know a quick way to get out of here. All right, Genesis 21, verses 8 uh, through 13. Look what it says. This is talking about now, after Isaac was born, the supernatural, the, the child of the spirit, rather than the child of the flesh, which was Ishmael. Now we have the child of the spirit, and God will love both, but God says, no, the spiritual thing that I've done, that's through Isaac. Look at this. No, Isaac, the child, grew, verse 8, and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, scoffing. So look, the, the spiritual battle begins right here. The flesh versus the spirit. Therefore she said to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice, for in... Isaac, your seed shall be called. Again, God said, I love Ishmael. I'm going to bless Ishmael, but it's through the line of Isaac that I'm going to bring the Messiah. That's where Jacob was born through Isaac and the 12 tribes of Israel. And that's where we have the 12 tribes today. And that's how we have our Messiah, Jesus Christ. The line, the blessed line came through Isaac. He says, yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he is your seed. In other words, I'm going to bless. I love Ishmael. I love the Arab people. I've just not made the promise of the Messiah through them. It's coming through the Jews. And now we see God's promise to Abraham, to those who bless Abraham and his descendants. And now again, the confirmation and completion of that promise, that it's unconditional and that it's a, a promise that is given now through the descendants of, 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 of Isaac to Jacob and on down to his children. But the last thing I want to note today is God's promise is eternal for the nation of Israel. It is not a temporary promise. It is not faded with the cross. It didn't die when Jesus died. It's not the old covenant. It is a new covenant promise. I want you to turn now lastly today to Jeremiah chapter 31. Just head right in your Bible again. Uh, until you come to, you'll see the Psalms, prophets, keep on going to the major prophets. You'll come to Jeremiah after Isaiah and go to chapter 31. It's not that I don't think you guys know your Bible. It's just that I know when I was a baby Christian, it was helped to have a little bit of mapping direction as I was looking for stuff. So I know you guys know your Bible, but we may have some new believers in here. I'm not trying to insult anyone. But chapter 31, verses 31 through 37, notice what it says here. Now, uh, the promise that, that Jeremiah the prophet is making prophetically to the nation of Israel. Look what it says. Verse 31 Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. How shocking that would have been. The old covenant, they knew. It was Moses. It was Mount Sinai. It was the law. It was written on stone, and God had given. It was the covenant. It was sealed in blood as Moses sprinkled blood on the people, and they made a covenant before God in the old covenant. That's what happened. Now, all of a sudden, Jeremiah goes, I have an announcement. There's going to be a new covenant. A brand new one. It's going to be one that's going to come after this and it's going to replace the old covenant. We now know that new covenant is Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross in his blood. And what did Jesus say the last night before he went to the cross with his disciples? He said, this is my body and my blood that is given to you in a what? A new covenant. So what's happening here is he's prophesying about what Jesus is going to do on the cross and the new covenant of blood through the cross for not only the Gentile, but the nation of Israel. He says, I'm going to make a new covenant with the Jews, not according to the covenant that I made with your fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. He says, the covenant they broke, and they also broke his heart. But God says, I'm going to restore you with a new covenant by the blood. They're going to be forgiven as a nation. He says, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. 
I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. How could it be in their mind and in their heart? It's because the spirit of God is gonna now be in them. Jesus giving the Holy Spirit, moving inside of all believers, Jew and Gentile. It's now not just written in the mind by the law and obeying all the rules. Now it's written in the heart based on love. And he says, that's the new covenant. It's coming, it's coming. You don't know it yet, but I'm gonna do it. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Now note this. The context, before we read these next verses, and context is huge in interpreting Scripture. That's what's before it and what's after it. The context is the new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ. Now they don't say the blood of Jesus Christ because they didn't know what the new covenant was yet. But now we know, historically, the, the, the promise here to the nation is based after the cross. After the cross. It's a new covenant to the nation of Israel after Jesus dies. Notice what it says. Verse 35. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and the waves roar, says the, and the Lord of hosts, or the Lord of battle literally is his name, if those ordinances, if what ordinances? The sun rising and shining every day, the moon shining at night. If those ordinances, sun and the moon, if they depart from me before the Lord, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Listen to what God just said. You'll know if I'm done with the nation of Israel whether or not the sun comes up and the moon is still in the sky. In the new covenant, if the sun's still coming up and the moon's still shining, I hadn't given up on him. I'm not done with him. My promise is sure. My promise is steady. I walked between the covenant parts alone. I didn't even let Abraham try to keep his half. Doesn't matter whether he messes up. Doesn't matter whether he does good. I'm keeping this based on my name. And so as long as you see the sun and the moon, my promise is still intact. He goes, if that wasn't enough, he goes on. He wants to drive it home. Look what he says, verse 37. Thus says the Lord, if heaven can be measured, which it can't be, we have no idea how big the universe is. It changes every year. I know. If heaven can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, which they've never been and can't be, I also will cast off all the seed of Israel for, the, for all that they've done, says the Lord. Notice this. He says, now, also, if you can measure the heavens and measure the earth on top of the sun coming up and the moon shining, if all that disappears, I have to be careful saying moonshine in the south, but you get my point, moon shining. He says, why do I do that? I'm sorry. Let's stay focused, Mark. Um, he says, if you see those ordinances in place, if you see those ordinances in place, my promise to the nation of Israel is still intact. Now you know where to see that. Now guys, notice he finishes with saying, but what about when they do wrong? What about when they do wrong? Look, look at the last line. He says, I'll not cast them off even for all that they've done, says the Lord. Now, does this justify Israel if they ever do something wrong? No. Will God hold them accountable if they do wrong? Yes. Do we not agree if they do something wrong? Yeah, we don't agree if they do something wrong. But he's saying, it doesn't matter. It's not based on whether they do right or wrong. It's based on my covenant, walking between the parts by myself, a sealed covenant, unconditional, that will be in place as long as the sun and the moon are shining, even after the new covenant is in place with Jesus Christ and his blood, all the way till the very end. And God said, in the last days, you're gonna see the world begin to turn against them. And you're going to see some people stand with them and some not stand with them. It's interesting when you read Matthew 25, which we don't have time to do. I know that in Matthew 25, the Lord is talking about during the great tribulation, those that are taking care of all the believers. But it's going to be a majority of Jews because the Gentile church has been taken out in the rapture, which means predominantly what the Lord is saying is during the great tribulation, those who give water, those who visit in prison, those who give food, those who give clothing, you're taking care of the Jewish people. He said, blessed are you, enter into the joy of the Lord because you took care of my brethren. And there's gonna be people today that are gonna regret the fact they didn't know the word of God good enough to know where they're supposed to stand. Again, we're not justifying anything that's done wrong. We're simply standing with the God of the universe, the promise that he made with Abraham, the unconditional promise that lasts all the way through the second covenant. And the bottom line is that God's gonna use all this against them uh, or use when the world comes against them to bring them to him and make us one big family in the very end. And guys, we're getting closer and closer every moment. Like I said, we don't know when the Lord's coming back. We don't know how that's going to all pan out. I don't know. Could this start the trigger that makes everything else happen? Possibly. Maybe not. Maybe it dies down and we have more time. You know, whatever. I don't know what the case is going to be, but here's what I do know as we finish today. This is a real good time as a believer to make sure you have your life in order with God. 
This is not a time to be goofing off, guys. Listen, there's never a time to be goofing off. I should say living in sin. But if there's ever a time to make sure that you've got your accounts right with God, now's the time to do it. Get right with God and be ready for the return of your Messiah. For blessed are those, Jesus said, who are watching and ready. And make sure that's you. As far as the nation of Israel, we need to continue to pray for them. As far as anybody here that doesn't know the Lord today, listen, if there's ever a time to get your life right with God, not just believers, but the unbeliever, you do not want to be here when this mess takes place. God said to the church there in the days of the rapture, he said, pray that you may escape these things coming upon the earth. I have no problem praying that I may escape these things. I know some people that may want to be here. I have no problem saying, I don't want to be here. I want to be in the kingdom having a great feast and enjoying the Lord. I don't necessarily want to be facing all the mess that's down here. If God desires for us to go through some of that, we will. But the bottom line is, if you've not received the Lord, listen, it's as simple as saying, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. You repent and turn from your sins and you believe he died for you on the cross. And the Bible says you're not only saved from your sins and forgiven, but you have your place in eternal, the eternal kingdom. And I believe based on the scriptures that you also will be taken out of here before the ugliest stuff begins to happen that the Bible talks about in the last days. Guys, that's a ticket that I want to have. And that's a ticket that you want to have as well. Let's pray that God would do that this morning. Father, I thank you again for this morning for showing us, Lord, why we stand with Israel. Why the, conditional, the covenant is unconditional. Why the, the, the covenant is eternal. You're not done with them. Or you're just, just getting started. Let us stand, not just in the right place historically, let us stand in the right place eternally. And Lord, to enjoy the reward that comes with that. As you said, blessed are you, enter into the joy of your rest, for you took care of my brethren. So Lord, I thank you for what you've shown us. I pray for anyone here today who doesn't know you, God, they wouldn't leave here without getting their heart right, that they would confess their sin, turn to you as Lord and Savior, and receive you as Lord. And so God, we trust in your Holy Spirit to do just that. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.